So I have 30 minutes to um, help us all solve the mystery of existence. <laughs> so I won't waste any time. Uh, how many people have heard me talk about the human universe before, if any? Okay, so apologies for some repetition. About five years ago, I wrote a book called God, A Story of Revelation. And it was about how human beings have thought about uh, the mystery of the universe, about existence, uh, about God for literally 5,000 years or approximately 5,000 years. So it goes back to biblical times. It ends with a conversation between Einstein uh, and Tagore, the great Indian uh, poet, mystic, uh, philosopher, sage. And basically the argument uh, uh, happened in 1930, uh, a conversation, I shouldn't say an argument, it wasn't a debate, but it was about the nature of reality. And as you know, Einstein was what they call a realist, which means there's a universe independent of consciousness. And uh, Tagore came from a different tradition where the universe is uh, an experience in consciousness. They never ag agreed about anything. Yeah, if you know Einstein, uh, he's known very much for that statement, the moon would still be there if no one was looking at it. Uh, the response to that, of course, the obvious response to that is, how do you know? <laughs> right? In any case, I had written this book and I was traveling the country and um, I um, stopped in Los Angeles where I was picked up by my son and my then five-year-old grandson, Krishan Chopra, whose mother is Chinese-American, so we call him the Chindian and he's a little pre precocious. <laughs> and um, uh, we also refer to him as the master race. Um, two-thirds of the human population uh, between China and India. So when I got uh, out of baggage claim, uh, this little boy, my little Chindian, he looks at me and he says, Dada, which is the Indian word for grandfather uh, on the father's side. He says, what is dark energy? <laughs> so that's an interesting question coming from a five-year-old. I said, what do you know about dark energy? And he said, it flows through the night sky. I said, that's beautiful. What else do you know about it? He said, it's 70% of the universe. <laughs> do you see why I think he's a very precocious little fellow? Anyway, we got out of the airport and we were driving by Santa Monica. I rolled down the window, we could see the ocean, and he turns to me again and he says, uh, how did they make the ocean? I said, how did, who make the ocean? He said, they. I said, no, that's not a legit question. You have to tell me what you mean by they. And so he thought for a bit and he reframed the question. He said, how did the ocean get made? So I said, well, it got made the same way as the Earth. We split off a giant star, lots of little pieces of dust and water, and we call that the solar system. And I turned the question back at him. I said, do you know how many planets there are in the solar system? And he said, well, if you count Pluto, there are nine. <laughs> but a lot of people don't think Pluto is a planet. So then there would be eight. I said, and where did the solar system come from? And he said, from the galaxy. I said, uh, and do you know the name of the galaxy? He said, Milky Way. I said, and where did the galaxy come from? He said, from the universe. And I said, where did the universe come from? And without batting an eyelid, he said, from another dimension. <laughs> so by now I'm thinking, who's recycling? You know, in India, everything recycles, including souls, call it reincarnation. So I'm thinking Galileo, Copernicus, 
all these names are coming. Then I said, Krishu, how do you know all this? Because this is what I've been thinking about for 30 years. And he kind of summarized it in less than two minutes. <coughs> he said, it's on my Pokemon. So, if you don't know what Pokemon is, you're not part of the zeitgeist. Anyway, what he was referring to are the two most biggest open questions in science. Go to Google, type out open questions in science, and the number one open question in science is, what is the universe made of? And why is it open? Because 70% is dark energy, which uh, Maynas and other astrophysicists will tell you is this uh, anti-gravity, cosmological constant, lots of names, that is ripping space apart faster than the speed of light. So right now, the cosmic horizon, where galaxies are tumbling into the unknowable, is 47 billion light years away from where we are. And beyond that is not only unknown, but unknowable, because by the, light, by the time light comes from there, to where we are, our solar system will have exhausted its thermonuclear energy and burnt itself up into the heat death of absolute zero. And we don't know what this force is, 70%. That leaves 30% of the universe, out of which 26%, approximately, is dark matter. And dark matter is invisible because it's not made of atoms. So everything we can see, sense, examine is made of atoms, which reflect light, absorb light, emit light, refract light, but dark matter is not atomic, so we cannot interact with it. There are lots of theories what it might be, but it's certainly not atomic matter. <coughs> Why is it called matter? Because it bends space-time in the same way as regular matter does, which means it's responsible for most of the gravity in the universe. It holds a galaxy together. And today, Avtar Singh, who's here, he's also a physicist, cosmologist. There he is. He sent me an article from a science magazine, the latest, uh, latest. Uh, statistics that there might be two trillion galaxies. We may have been off in our estimate of galaxies by 20 times. Two trillion galaxies with 700 sextillion stars. You can't even think what that number is. And that means trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of planetary systems. And that's um, held together. These galaxies are held together by dark matter. Whatever it is, we don't know what it is. So that leaves 4% of the universe, which is atomic, of which 99.999999% is invisible interstellar dust. So the visible universe with 700 sextillion stars and two trillion galaxies is 0.01%. 0.01% of what exists out there. It's made of atoms, but atoms are made of particles, and particles in turn, if you keep looking at them, they remain particles, but if you don't look at them, or if they don't interact with other particles, they disappear into what are called waves. And unlike particles, which have units of mass and energy, waves are just made of possibilities. You know, when you look at an ocean wave, it's made of water. The air waves that are bringing sound to you right now are made of the vibration of atmosphere. But waves that make particles are made of possibilities. So when you ask mathematicians or physicists, where do these possibilities exist? They'll say in Hilbert space. Hilbert is some mathematician. 
say, yeah, but where exactly? And the answer is, shut up and calculate. <laughs> In other words, the universe is made out of nothing. That's our current cosmology. And what is the nothingness from where we all come? Is it just an empty void, or could it be the womb of creation? Why did Rumi say, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust? He said, look at these worlds, spinning out of nothingness, this could be you. And so, here is the history of the universe, as humans have thought about it for the last uh, 5,000 years or less. The divine universe, God, usually a dead white male, <laughs> created the universe and is the source and origin of life and mind. And there are versions of this in every mythology, different kinds of versions. And this went on till we saw the classical universe of Isaac Newton, who, although he believed in God, he said, you know, God created the laws of physics, Newtonian physics, but the universe is now ruled by fixed laws of nature, knowable through human reason and logic. And around this time, there were these other luminaries who were all more or less saying the same thing. Leibniz, who, along with Newton, is credited with um, with calculus, Rene Descartes, you know, there's mind and there's body, there's the spiritual world and there's the physical world, Spinoza, Voltaire, other luminaries, but basically this is the classical universe. R ruled by the laws of motion, universal gravitation, uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which Newton explained, the motion of objects on Earth and celestial bodies, and the laws of thermodynamics. And this was very much the prevailing science till Albert Einstein, who basically described two kinds of theories, came up with two kinds of theories, the special theory of relativity in 1905, the general theory of relativity in 1915, and basically, even if you don't know the math, you know uh, the mass energy equivalence formula e is equal to mc squared. And there's a fixed speed of light for all frames of reference. And then 10 years later, the general theory of relativity, which basically said that uh, unlike other forces, gravity is probably um, a wrinkle in space-time and this led to the discovery of black holes, gravitational red shift of light, gravitational time delay, and I'm not gonna go into details. If you watched, anybody watch Interstellar, the movie? Okay, so that's based on this, and recently you saw the discovery of gravity waves confirming um, Einstein's theory of relativity. And so this universe is much more dynamic. And in this universe, space-time, matter, and energy are all interdependent. In fact, they are the same thing. So space-time, matter, and energy are fundamentally inseparable. And this was very comfortable till the quantum universe. And these are some of the people, even though Einstein was one of the contributors, this is the theory that he was very uncomf uncomfortable with, because as you know, all the quantum mechanics describes the micro-universe. Quantum mechanics does not describe um, the big universe. This, what we see, and the big universe at large. You know, black holes, and cosmic horizon, and everything else. So there was a lot of discomfort between Einstein and these other great luminaries. But essentially, uh, these are the fundamental tenets of quantum mechanics. It deals with the behavior of electrons, photons, and other elementary particles. The fundamental processes are ambiguous. I just mentioned particles are also waves. Particles are things. Waves are possibilities. And uh, there is, of course, 
uh, the idea that the movement of atoms is random. There's something called uncertainty principle and superposition, which means at the most fundamental levels, everything is entangled with everything else. And uh, there is the idea of non-locality, that there is a dimension of existence where everything is correlated with everything else faster than the speed of light, in fact, instantaneous. So if you have a particle in one end of the galaxy and a particle in the other, as soon as you measure the state of this one, you also determine the state of the other. And this entanglement or correlation is not only instantaneous, it's unmitigated, which means it does not, the robustness of the correlation does not diminish with distance in space and time. And also, it's unmediated. There's no medium uh, through which the information goes from one place to the other. And this is very uncomfortable. I think the best way to explain this is that um, if Einstein is in his grave, and Niels Bohr in his grave in Copenhagen, and Einstein in his grave in New Jersey, when Einstein turns one way, uh, Bohr turns the other way instantaneously. That's called non-local correlation. They never agreed with each other in their lifetime, and they still don't agree. Quantum mechanics um, has um, uh, many interpretations. So quantum mechanics as a calculation works. In fact, all our economy, 70% of our economy today is based on the insights or the calculations of quantum mechanics. When you send somebody a text message, email, uh, these days anything from uh, a song to a movie, uh, transistors, and much of what we do today is based on the uh, calculations of quantum mechanics. And you'll read a lot more about this in my next book with Menas Kafatos, who did the physics, and most of all of the physics in the book. But if you go to Wikipedia, this is what you'll see. Interpretations of quantum mechanics. So you see so many interpretations. Interpretations is not the same thing as the calculation. Interpretation is of special interest to those of us who want to go beyond shut up and calculate. <laughs> Those who want to, but what does it mean? Okay, so these are the interpretations and you can find them on Wikipedia. And there are over 20 of them. And this means, of course, that if there are more than 20 interpretations and increasing by the day, then I think it's fair to say no one knows what's going on. <laughs> <coughs> So until recently, the Copenhagen interpretation was the most popular, which means you need an observer to collapse the wave function, that before you look at the universe, it doesn't exist. And um, these days, uh, because that raises all kinds of questions about consciousness and God and, and universal consciousness, uh, scientists are not very happy with that. So these days, there's something called eternal inflation, which is, uh, the most popular, and eternal inflation is also called chaotic inflation, and uh, it's very difficult to understand mathematically, so I asked one of my physicist friends who actually described dark matter, Joel Premack, who's at the University of California, um, can you explain uh, eternal inflation to me? So he said, here's a metaphorical way to understand it. Imagine a cosmic casino outside of space and time. And it's existed for eternity. And in the cosmic casino are an infinite number of slot machines. And they are throwing up coins for an infinite duration of time. And of course, because there are infinite slot machines for eternity and infinite uh, tosses of coins, Whenever a coin comes back heads up, it doubles in size. Whenever a coin comes back tails up, it halves in size. And then you have this scenario where you have an infinity of tails. So one tail after another for infinity till the final size of the coin is Planck size. And there's a hole in the cosmic casino which is Planck size. 
And this quantum fluctuation escapes the hole and spins off into a universe. <laughs> and because this is infinite, there are infinite universes, because there's an infinite possibilities of this happening in an infinite cosmic casino. Talk about mathematical mythology, <laughs> but this is the most popular theory about how the universe is created. Uh, there's no way to validate this, falsify this, test it, experiment it, because what happens before the uh, 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 Planck scale, of what is called Planck time, is uh, not possible to test. So here are the theories. Eternal inflation, super strings, multiverse, multi-worlds, M theory, which is a collection, no data, no observations possible, and so what we are left with now is the fabric of uh, nature has reached a dead end. Dark matter, we don't know what it is. Dark energy, we don't know what it is. The visible universe, 0.01%, and we don't know what that is because it's made of possibilities. So here we are. Not a very comfortable place for science to be in. So, because random events are not um, um, enough to explain the exquisite fine-tuning of the universe and the laws of nature and the rise of life on Earth, there are other people who are saying, uh, speaking about the conscious universe. I was uh, in a debate with uh, Richard Dawkins a while ago, and he screamed at me because I was quoting Freeman Dyson. And finally, I wrote to Freeman Dyson because Dawkins said he should sue me. Um, and I said to uh, uh, Freeman Dyson, as you may know, he's one of the most prominent physicists of the century at, um, at um, Princeton University and one of the people still alive. 90 plus, a colleague of Einstein, and he wrote back, and I have his email, he said, three riddles have um, confused me all my life. One is um, the random or unpredictable movement of atoms, unpredictable movement of atoms. Number two, the fine-tuning of the universe, a universe that's fine-tuned for life and mind. And number three, our own consciousness. And in his amazing humility, he said, I have no idea what the answers to these riddles are, but I think they may be connected. So I have preserved that email for posterity, and um, this is what I'd like to propose to you, is that um, how do we know the universe exists? Well, because of our ability to have an experience of it. You are having the experience of this room. You're having the experience of uh, me on the stage, these beautiful flowers, and um, that in itself is a mystery. Because um, the second open question in science is, how do we know the universe exists? How do we know anything exists? Because we're conscious beings. And so the second mystery is, where does consciousness come from? What is the biological basis of consciousness? According to science, what you're seeing here is the result of photons coming from here to your eyes. Those photons are just electromagnetic radiation. They have no color, they have no dimensionality. Some of them uh, were manufactured uh, at the time of the Big Bang, and they're bouncing off this, whatever this is, and they're coming to your eyes and you have a chemical reaction in your eyes, and then um, that sends a, an electrical current to your brain, and um, there's some chemical reaction happening in your brain, and you see this. How do you see this? If all that's happening in your brain is chemistry. You're not experiencing chemistry, you're looking at this, and you said, that's an experience. You're looking at this room. How does this room fit inside your brain? You know, when you talk to cognitive scientists, you say, so where are you having the experience of seeing me? 
And they say, well, my eyes, your eyes are 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. They're nine centimeters apart. By the time light gets into your retina, it gets inverted and your retina is curved. Are you seeing two of me upside down this big, nine centimeters apart and curved? <laughs> Obviously not. Well, then they say, I'm seeing you in my brain. Well, how do I fit inside your brain? How does this room fit inside your brain? Go outside and look at the Milky Way galaxy. How does that fit inside your brain? We have a problem. We don't know how we experience this or anything. If I ask you to imagine right now a beautiful sunset on the ocean, do it. Do you see a picture? There's no picture inside your brain. You're experiencing a picture. You're experiencing this. Again, Rumi has a beautiful poem. He says, look at your eyes. They are so small, and yet you see enormous things. So this is the second problem in science. First is, the universe is made out of nothing. And the second is, we have no idea how we experience it. <laughs> or where is the experience happening? Because it's not happening in your brain. In fact, your brain is an experience in your consciousness. Your body is an experience in your consciousness. The entire universe is an experience in your consciousness. And we cannot find consciousness anywhere. You cannot touch it, taste it, smell it, hear it, find it, localize it. Where is it? So when you look at some of the greatest wisdom traditions, they say, um, when you say, where is consciousness, you're asking the wrong question. Because, because where implies a location in space and an existence in time. And your consciousness is not in space-time. In fact, consciousness is that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seeing. It is that which cannot be heard, tasted, smelt, perceived, imagined, or thought of, but without which there is no imagination, perception, cognition, or anything that we call this. So the Vedanta goes even further, it says, if you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, it's not real. <laughs> the only thing that's real is that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seeing. So this is what the great wisdom traditions have said. The universe is consciousness. The universe is the excitations of consciousness. It is the activity of consciousness. It is experienced in consciousness. It evolves in consciousness. And it subsides in consciousness. In fact, the universe is what consciousness looks like when it looks at itself. And you are that consciousness. You are the consciousness that looks at itself and says, this is reality. So I see Rupert Spiras in the audience, and he, he says very elegantly <laughs> that consciousness is that in which uh, experience arises, manifests, is that in which the universe is known, is that in which the experience uh, of the universe or any experience subsides. And the fundamental excitations of consciousness are just very simple things, sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. Or what we could use as an acronym, SIFT, S-I-F-T, if you want to think of, uh, you want to remember this. And if all experience is uh, consciousness sifting itself, itself out as the body, the mind, and the universe. In other words, the universe is a human construct. It's a human construct. It's the interpretation of consciousness to itself as a result of its experiences, which are very fundamental excitations of consciousness itself, modified forms of consciousness, sensations, images, feelings, thoughts. And so uh, what I propose to you that uh, 
this is also the very fundamental realization of the great non-dual traditions, Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism, and in a way even Buddhism, although the vocabulary is different, but it's still the same. That, um, and this is a very famous uh, expression in Sanskrit, aham brahmasmi, I am the universe. You are the universe. Tattvamasi, I am that, you are that, all this is that, that's all there is. And so, the terminology for this is Brahman and Brahman. Brahman is consciousness, and Brahman is the vibration of consciousness as the experienced universe, Tattvamasi. There is only consciousness, there's nothing else. Now this kind, kind of sign can sound nihilistic because there's no such thing as a body, okay? No such thing as a body. The body is a continuous, intermittent experience of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. You had a body as a toddler, as a baby, you have this body, and in fact, the body that you have now uh, isn't the body that you walked in with a few minutes ago. So the body is a human construct. It's an idea. There's no such thing as a mind either, okay? These are so human constructs. The mind is just the same thing at a subtle level. It's your subtle body, if you want to call it a body, but there's no such thing. It's a human construct. And finally, there's no such thing as a universe. There's just you. The universe is only consciousness. Every day reality is a human construct. Now, I had an interesting meeting with a very famous um, cosmologist, astrophysicist, who's kind of very snooty. He thought he was doing a favor uh, by meeting me um, because he didn't want to give credibility to what he called a charlatan. And in the room was a mathematician, a very famous math mathematician. I'm not going to throw names, but one of the best in the world. And, um, uh, I asked, of course, this cosmologist if he could explain how you experience this. And he couldn't, so I said, how can you, if you can't explain this, how do you, can you explain stars and galaxies and the billions of universes? He didn't know how to respond. And he said, I'm going to try and explain mathematically um, how the universe came out of nothing, to which the mathematician said, um, he said to him, there is no universe, it's a human construct. And so you said you were going to explain this? Explanation is a silly word. There's no explanation for anything. The word explanation should be banned. <laughs> it was a very interesting conversation, but this led to what I'm proposing to you right now. Fundamental realities, the awareness, the excitations of which are the experience of both the observer and the observed in the timeless now. I shouldn't even say the timeless moment of now, uh, in the timeless now. And in every moment, what's happening is consciousness is, uh, in a way, differentiating itself as observer, process of observation, and observed. And the fundamental experience of both observer and observed is sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts uh, Sift, Daniel Siegel, who's a neuropsychiatrist, uh, offered that, cinema, uh, uh, that uh, acronym to me a while ago, and I've been using it, and then I noticed uh, um, Rupert Spira uses sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts, and those are basically all that experience is. It's experience in consciousness, it's an activity of consciousness. So systems of thought, human constructs, have been many through the ages, religious, theological, philosophical, scientific, and now, of course, we have economic, political, and mythological explanations. But do you realize that these are all human constructs? We created them. We created money, we created commerce, we created technology, we created nation states, we created tribes, and we created the concept of homo sapiens, which means the wise ones, which is, of course, a name we gave to ourselves. <laughs> and then we created 
animals, we gave them names to experiences, and we said, this is a giraffe, this is a hippopotamus, this is a dolphin. Human constructs. A dog has no idea that it's called a dog, <laughs> right? A dog in the White House doesn't know who Obama is. Obama is. Why? Because Obama, White House, President, White Oval Office, nation states, countries, planets, universe are all human constructs. No system of thought can give you access to reality. And no construct has a privileged position over others, whether it's mythological or religious or theological or scientific. Because it's a system of thought. And thought itself is a modulation of consciousness, right? And all the other things that we call perception, sensations, they're basically all entangled with each other. They're all movements of consciousness within itself. And so the construct is real for the, for the being that's embedded in it. If you're embedded in a mythological construct, that's your reality. Religious construct, that's your reality. Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever, Islamic, it's your reality. If you have been promised a million bananas, if you give up your banana now in banana heaven, <laughs> that's your construct. <laughs> Excitations of, of awareness within themselves constitute all experience. And these excitations are experienced as time. But actually, there is no time. There's only now in which the experience comes and goes in the flash of a microsecond. So the past is a dream, the future is a dream, and the present is a dream. Because the present is arising and subsiding right now. You can't catch it. That's why the German uh, philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said, our life is a dream. We are asleep. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. And so we wake up to what? We wake up to the awareness in which the dream is happening. As you're listening to me right now, just be aware of who's listening. There you have it. That's a presence in which this dream is happening right now. The present is also a dream. Birth, death, body, mind, brain, universe, the usual concept of God, stars, galaxies, Big Bang, Anything that humans have given a name, humans itself is a name, are constructs. I hope this is not hopelessly abstract, <laughs> right? As soon as the fall from grace is basically subject-object split, me and the universe. And it's all one thing, and it's not a thing at all. Freedom, therefore, is in being, without constructs, and it is now.